Okay. So we had uh, some exercises. Hold on one second here. All right, so we had some exercises in chapter four um, that we had. Okay. Um, a lot of them were pretty straightforward. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, we had some that were, um, that had, uh, you know, just kind of learning where information comes from, where it goes into what schedule, and then where it goes on to eventually the 1040, okay? Uh, 4A um, had, do, 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 do. let's see, where is that? That's on page. Yeah, okay. So we had uh, in, um, uh, interest income uh, there that was interest and then we had one that was dividends that we had uh, put on there okay so where that went for schedule um, B now this one too had a uh, little extra um, had some things with um, uh, total capital gains distributions okay um, on those on 4a those would go on to um, your Schedule D, which uh, we don't talk about until, let's see here, uh, what, two classes, two or three classes. So we'll kind of come back to that. We'll see more of that with the capital gains distributions. Um, you know, what that is, as I talked about, is sometimes, you know, um, stock, you may not have sold stock like we saw in that 1099B that I helped handed out, but you may have stock that's had gains within your portfolio, and basically you're paying tax as it goes along um, so that you know that you've paid instead of maybe waiting to pay the tax all at the end where it, uh, when you cash the stock in, okay? Um, so yeah, you pay as you go along. This one had tax withheld, and then we talked about it has uh, foreign tax paid, um, you know, so that one carries over to page two of the 1040, that's uh, line 48 uh, that has that foreign tax credit. Okay, uh, when we get into uh, one of the problems we're gonna talk about here in the second, um, we'll talk about how you get it over there, how you can enter that. There's a couple different ways um, with the foreign tax credit. Um, sometimes it depends too on a foreign tax credit. It may be something for somebody that actually lived or worked in a foreign country and has uh, income, okay? So sometimes it comes that way, but there's a very simple way to get that over, okay? Um, the questions that are typically sometimes once you have foreign income, you see that part three on your schedule B at the bottom of 411, there's those questions. Um, typically you can answer those no, but you can always ask, you know, it says, do you have a financial interest or signature authority over a financial account? If you answer yes, then chances are we're going to have to do what's called an F bar. That's a foreign bank disclosure. So for those people that are hiding money offshore. How about a Canadian account? Mm -hmm. That's still foreign country, right? Yep, that's still foreign. So sometimes you'll have that. Um, you do the FBAR and a couple other forms um, for the purpose of uh, disclosing that. Um, a lot of it's just paperwork. Um, if it's something that has uh, excess of $10,000, you're required to report it. Um, they keep changing the rules a little bit. Um, so they, they keep doing different ones on there. So, but um, they, um, um, you typically have to disclose all those foreign bank accounts and show the income that's over there. Uh, a lot of countries, then there's another form that you do that you basically can say that you're uh, recognizing the treaty, especially like between the United States and Canada, that there's a treaty that uh, we're disclosing this and there's no tax repercussions because the two countries have agreed to allow their citizens not to pay taxes, you know, in other countries, so. Oh, we have that with Canada? Mm -hmm. So, if we do have accounts, there's no tax? It's a lot of times it comes up, the treaty comes up if you have a U.S. citizen living in Canada and on their tax return because they're living over there, they're not gonna have that money taxed twice because it's taxed in Canada and they're not gonna have to report to tax it here and that's basically what the treaty says. What happens if you're only a beneficiary? Um, yeah. Beneficiary, you still have to report it. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Um, I have to see if I have an F bar because it's an online process that you have to log into. So unless I'm going to actually do one, I can't really get in to show you on it. But uh, there's, um, I have to see if I can find an F bar and show it to you with what it looks like. Okay. Uh, so yeah, like I said, the bottom of those don't really worry about those. Uh, you can see that second it says is if yes, uh, report uh, foreign bank and financial accounts, better known as FBAR. So you have to do that where you have the signature authority on those. Sometimes it's joint accounts. I have one client that her husband is Canadian and she is a US citizen, but they live in Canada and she has to do things. She's still collecting social security and some other stuff that from when she was in the States prior to becoming a Canadian resident. So she has a return that she has to do. Um, her husband's never gotten a social security number, never got a uh, um, ITIN, which is sometimes a international, somebody with uh, international ties would get a, um, a social security number, pseudo social security number, I guess you could call it. Um, so she just does married filing separate. And we always have to mail them in because her husband's never gotten a social security number. So, okay. Um, on page, let's see, we had page 4B, it kind of did a little worksheet. Did everybody follow along with the worksheet determining the um, taxable portion of a um, state and local refund? 4B, there's a... Uh, yeah, the gray area. Yeah, the gray worksheet. Mm -hmm. Um, what that is, is um, the calculation there is uh, just based on, you know, is the state refund. Typically what happens is that refund is not taxable. Um, if the, uh, say it's a joint return with kids on it and there's the child tax credit, New York child tax credit. So that's a refundable credit. So that is not, you subtract that out. Remember when we did the one problem, I said that they had a refund, um, but they didn't itemize last year, so that's not taxable. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll have a couple problems that'll come up here where we'll have a $1,000 um, refund, but they had two kids, and on the state, that's $330 per child, so you'd subtract out that 660 from it, and then the remainder, the $340 would be taxable. So, okay. All right, so that's kind of, I think, what happens on this one, if I remember right. Yeah, well, this one, they just kind of said it's all taxable. Because they just used the one taxable amount there. Okay. All right. Okay. And then on page four C, um, I guess it's relevant. Well, no, it'll stay relevant because everybody's grandfathered in. So this one you still need to know about. Uh, what payments are considered alimony. Um, this one says what are not. And child support, non-cash property settlements, payments that are the spouse's part of community income, payments to keep up the payer's property or use of the payer's property, okay? So those are not considered alimony payments. Um, like I talked about the um, laws changing uh, going forward, where alimony income and alimony paid as a deduction no longer exist, but that doesn't mean that everybody that's been paying it up to this point gets to stop. So everybody's going to be grandfathered in if their divorce decree was finalized. And like I said, I, I have a feeling there may be some renegotiations of some divorces or changes or people have been holding off. Um, I know one individual that his... Uh, Divorce has been dragging on for two years now, and I think uh, nobody will come out and say it, obviously, but I think a lot of it's because they're trying to get the favorable, you know, tax situation. Because believe it or not, he's the one that's going to be receiving the alimony. 
So he's been kind of dragging it out so that he doesn't have to pay tax on what he's paid because it'll go past the, the, the line for the alimony. So, okay. Um, 4D, same thing. Uh, write yes if it's considered alimony. Write no if it's not considered alimony. Anybody have any questions on those? No? Okay. All right. And let's see. The next one was just a little bit um, about um, gambling winnings. Okay. So if you won $1.6 billion, okay, or in Jim's case, he bought a ticket for both the Mega and the Powerball, so he's going to bring home a cool 2.5. One will be enough. One will be enough. You're not going to get greedy, huh? Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, I stopped somewhere to get gas last night, and I was like, boy, I should have bought gas sooner. So, or wait till after Tuesday. So, because, you know, you come in, and sure enough, you know, there's a line of people, and they got extra people. I asked the gal, and she goes, yeah, we're keeping an extra person on just to stand at the machine. So, but. So, anyway, we talk about that, uh, those, uh, gambling winnings and gambling losses, okay? And as we discovered when we put it in there, um, in this case, in the example, uh, Michelle hit it big at the Winner's Casino and she won $1,500 in slots. So we have to put that on there as income. And where does it go on the income? What line? Line 21. Yep, line 21. And like we said, if you go in there and you get up that form in the software, you know, it'll give you the little W2G form. If you do not have, um, you know, the, the W2G and she's just reporting it, you may have to just enter it as one of those other lines on that, that uh, line 21. Um, but you may have to um, then carry it and manually put it in. And we'll talk about that when we get to itemized deductions, how to enter it there. Okay. I haven't been in in one year, but they last time they had they gave you like a credit card thing mm -hmm. that you put in. So that that the casino knows if what you did if you won lost you got all that information. Right? Yeah, yeah, and obviously there's you know that you can because if you have that players club type thing I guess they call it that you can have the the card that shows your net winnings or losses for the year, they'll give you a win-loss statement. And a lot of those are negative. I mean, I would guess 95% of the ones I see are losses. Um, but auditors now won't just take those. Um, you have to have more of a journal that says, I was there October 22nd. Um, I went in, I spent, um, I spent, uh, you know, $1,000. Um, but I, you know, lost or, you know, I spent $1,000, but I won $1,500. So, but, so you have to kind of go back and forth on that. You've been keeping a journal of them? Yeah, I haven't. I, I'm not going to be able to do that for 20 bucks. It has to be the same year. <laughs> well, but the thing is that you will get to itemize. Actually, those do have the date. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they have the date, so you can keep the tickets and losses. But the thing is, is you are going to take those losing tickets, even if you, you're thinking you don't because you don't itemize. Because if you think about it, you get to um, um, deduct state tax pay. But in that case, we're limited to 10000 so you might still get to itemize. Because if you, right now, I think it's, uh, what did I read, 8.82% is the tax on that in New York State. Oh. So, you know, 1.6 billion, 8.82%, that's a lot of state tax to pay. But with the new tax law, in SALT, you're gonna be limited. Hmm. Now, if you lived in Florida or Tennessee and win, you don't have to worry about it because you don't pay state tax on the winnings. But living in New York, we pay additional almost 10% tax on lottery wins. It's one of the highest in the country. The lowest 
place that is taxed, state tax is like, uh, I think North Dakota is like two and a half percent. So, I don't know if they have state tax. They don't have state tax. So, mm -hmm. I don't know if so you wouldn't pay it? No. Now you just pay federal. And federal is probably runs you about 45% when it's all said and done. That's okay. There's still plenty left over. <laughs> I, you know, that's if you take the lump sum. Now you can save yourself about $175 million um, if you take the uh, annuity, the payments, because then it's taxed a little bit lower. So that if you take those, you, yeah, you can save yourself about $175 million in taxes. Over the years. Yeah. So just something, yeah, just some decisions I'm gonna have to make. Yeah. Can they build that? Can there be a beneficiary on that? I don't know. Or when you die, it's done. So if you don't didn't finish it off. I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't know how that's set up. I, I've never won it, so I can't really tell you, so. That would be a good question, you know, some of those, because you see that one with um, publishers, you know, you get 5,000 a week for life or yeah. something like that, and uh, you can give it to somebody else. So I don't know if it's something that you have to negotiate when you go to do the, um, the, um, the different portions, so. so. All right, all right. So let's go through the quiz uh, for chapter four. Um, and we'll go around. All right, Ann, you want to start with number one? It's on page, what is it? Page uh, 436. Um, alimony is taxable to the recipient. It is included on the tax return form 1040 on one line, D, line 11. Yep. All right, Jim, number two. Um, so the question is, for this year, is there not going to be a line for alimony? No, it'll still be there because oh, they have to because of the people that were grandfathered in. So yes, there it won't necessarily be line 11 because of the postcard, postcard format. But yes, there will still be a spot for alimony received because if you had your divorce finalized prior to a certain date, you're still grandfathered in to pay. So. <clears throat> Two, what type of payment listed below is considered alimony payment? Uh, C, money, cash, checks, money. Okay, yep, all right. Unemployment compensation is reported to the taxpayer on which form? D, 10, form 1099-G. And like I said, you know, that's one that's not mailed to anybody anymore in New York. You have to go online to get it, and even if you phone in, they won't mail it to you unless you request it. And uh, during tax time, the unemployment offices are not very friendly about trying to get a copy of it, so. So can you get a copy, let's say, if they were on unemployment uh, three months ago and they're not longer on unemployment, they go in there and get it now for that? Or Chances it are it's not going to be generated till after the first of the year. Yeah. It is the state of New York, and they're probably not going to do anything early. Well, plus, they, 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 you might end up on unemployment again. You never know. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's just like a W-2. You, you know, you can't get it from your old job just because you're done with your old job. They waiting to make sure there's no other payments or anything they have to make before the end of the year. Maybe they owed you vacation, they forgot to pay you or something. Okay, uh, number four, Ann. If a taxpayer received an overpayment of unemployment compensation during 2017, the amount of overpayments need to be listed on the Form 1040 on what line? A, line 19. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ordinary dividends are C, taxed as ordinary income. Yep. Okay. All right. Statements to return the interest income from treasury bills. D, they're taxable on federal, but not on state. That's correct. Okay. What type of income is reported to the taxpayer on the W-2G? B, gambling winnings. Mm -hmm. Where on the tax return is income over $400 is listed on the 1099 miscellaneous box 7. Unemployed compensation report. C on Schedule C or Schedule C EZ to carry to Form 1041. Yep. And again, it's it's we have to interject that there because of the 1099 miscellaneous. We're going to talk a lot more about the Schedule C's and Schedule C EZ when we get into uh, business income or Schedule C. Uh, what do they call it? Yeah, business income not till closer to Thanksgiving, but. Uh, 
we have to talk about it now just because of the 1099 miscellaneous on there. Okay. All taxpayers must include their state refund on their tax return or 1040 line 10 defaults. Yep. Kind of a trick question. Yeah. It's true that you have to see if it goes on there, but it's not necessarily that everybody's state return is taxable, because some may not be. What type of income is taxable to the taxpayer? C, unemployment. Mm -hmm. Form 1099-C, cancellation of debt, would be listed as income on the tax return on which line? Form 1040. D, Form 1040, line 21. Yep. And like I said, you know, if you have that cancellation of debt, and uh, you know, your next question should, uh, you know, that 982, always talk to somebody, are they insolvent? I know Esther talked about it uh, on the radio show this past Saturday. She did a little thing on it, um, but talking about that and, you know, basically she said, you know, you are insolvent if you owe more than you're worth. You know, so if, you know, your debt is greater than your assets or what you own or what you have, and, you know, we're talking right down to, you know, the blue book value of your car, you know, your retirement account, you know, anything, savings, um, you know, your rare stamp collection, you know, anything that can have value if we sold it, we have to weigh that against what you owe to make sure to see if you're insolvent. Okay. All right. So we had you working on the problems in four, correct? Okay. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it this way. Uh, let's see here. Which uh, we did um, we did the Simpsons in class, correct? Okay. All right. All right. So we had that. Um, okay. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through. Um, we'll go through and I'll do uh, problem four, four, all right, and actually what I'm going to do, we talk about chapter five. I came up with uh, these sample names and uh, addresses. You know, I'll try to complete the return as much as how I would to interview somebody. Uh, especially on this one, I want to talk a little bit. I'll kind of show you a little more about that since we have a cancellation of debt. So, all right. So, we're going to do 4-4. Four, four. All right. Raylene, how are you today? Thank you. Good. Um, I have a copy of your W-2 here. So, I'm going to get the file started on you. And I have your Social Security number as 713-89-6523. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Always make sure that you check your Social Security number on your W-2. Mm -hmm. All right, because if uh, the number is wrong and it's turning the Social Security Administration wrong, they're going to give credit for your income to somebody else and it won't be credited towards your Social Security. I'm there twice in the system now. My last tax account, he put seven instead of nine at my last number. Okay. And I did not catch it on my um, 1040 form when we submitted it. And now I'm in the IRS as Mary Ann Giancola with my real one and Mary Ann Giancola with my one digital. And nobody had that social security number? I guess not. Okay, because you would so use it. There's a lot of people in there and they said I didn't pay my taxes. Yeah. Of course I did. Luckily I get all my paperwork. But yeah. All right, so we have. But they can't take it away. They can't get it out. No, I'm in there now. All right, so we have Raylene Crabtree. Is that your name? No middle initial? No. Okay. All right, and are you married? No, I'm not. Okay, all right, yeah, check your little bio sheet on the other I page did. there. Absolutely okay, did. make sure you weren't divorced and didn't get an alimony or anything. Yeah. Okay, and I have you at 579 Oak Lane. Is that correct? That is correct. In Newfane? Yes. And I see, based on your last name and your street, that your email address is tree lover. Yes. At gmail. Oops. 
Okay. And your home phone number? 716-652-2398. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have a cell phone? Yes. Okay. Another 716-223-8467. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. And what's your birth date? Uh, July 4th, 1975. Okay. And your occupation? I'm a laborer. Okay. So what do you do for a living? Cut trees down. Okay. All right. So, yeah. All I right. do with passion. Okay. So I have you filing single by yourself, as we said. You're not married. And no dependents living with you? No. Okay. All right. And uh, you lived in New York the entire year? Yes, I did. All right. And if you have a refund, uh, would you like it uh, deposited into your bank account that I have here on the sheet? Yes, please. Okay. Looks like an M&T account. Yes. All right. And I have 753-951-486. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. Just always want to double check. I'd hate to give your refund to somebody else. Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to give you a five-digit PIN number for your return. I'm just going to use your zip code. Okay? All right. Let me clean up a few things here. Right, you got your Are driver's you license? Me? Yes. Yeah, I'm just kind of, this is where me, I'm just kind of going along. So if you want to turn around and face the other way so you can watch on the screen. So, all right. Nope, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Okay, so I have that in. Okay, so I got her main info, most of her main information in. Okay. Which one? I know. I haven't been doing that. Yeah, it should start to autofill, but don't worry about it because that'll be. Um, something that's uh, automatic because there'll be a default in that for all that information once you're in actually live when it's connected to do electronic filing. That's a ERO is an electronic filing uh, number. So, All right, let's see Raylene. Um, did you itemize last year? What, what did you file? What type of form? Um, let's see. I think I I see here, let's see, you gave me a copy of last year's and it looked like you did a 1040 EZ, so that means that you would not. Okay, so we don't have to worry about any tax on your state refund. Okay, all right, and I have your W-2, okay. Uh, my other question for you is, uh, did you have uh, health insurance? Yes, I did. Okay, and was that through your employer? Yes, it was. Okay, so you had insurance all 12 months, so we don't have to worry about that. All right, and I have a W-2 here from Homes or Us? Yes. Okay. All right, so you do the tree work for them? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so I have that, and Homes or Us, and let's see, that's within the five, six, Main oops, Street, and that is, let's see, that's in Amherst, okay. And I have your income. You're not receiving any tips while you're doing this, are you? No. Okay, all right. Just making sure because we have to declare that tip income if you're receiving tips. And, uh, when they do the box is empty. You just put in uh, for the state. You put in a federal ID number. Yeah, New York State uses the same number. Oh, oh, okay. Yep, yep. So just fill that in on that. So yeah, you're talking about the employer state ID number. Yeah. Yeah, use the same one because uh, usually it's the same unless specified different, but uh, typically it is always the same. All right. So I have your income there. Okay. Any other tax documents you have for me? Uh, I have a cancellation of death. Okay, let's see. Let's get that in there. So the fact that they gave you um, uh, forgiveness on your credit card debt, we have to declare that, okay? All right, and like I said, we're going to put that on line 21. 
Uh, we want to get that worksheet. There's really no place per se for 1099C. The way I enter it is I put 1099C uh, on the, the blank line. See where I'm at there? Yeah, but where'd you get that worksheet from? Um, if I go to 1040 okay. and I go down to line 21 and I can click there or I can click the box and I hit F9, I'm going to get that worksheet 7. Okay, it's not the form 982 then. Well, we're going to talk about that one in a second, okay? okay. All, right. All right. So, and you had forgiveness from MasterCard on a credit card, yeah. okay? So, it shows you have to declare that income, 2541, okay? Now, um, are you insolvent, Raylene? My question for you is, is uh, do you owe more money than you have? So, sometimes with cancellation of debt, it's a case that... Uh, you know, with bankruptcy. So what we're going to do is you're going to say yes. Okay. Yes. yes, you are. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put in a form 982 for you. Um, that 982 form yes, is, insolvent. yep. So we're going to put you that uh, discharge of indebtedness to the extent insolvent. So if you look on part one up there, second one down B, I'm going to check that. Okay. And I'm going to put in my, uh, discharge of indebtedness from gross income, I'm gonna put that 2541, okay? Where'd you go to get? That form? I need to again just. I did add a form. Oh, okay. And then I typed, you can see up there in the top where it says look for, I typed in 982, it took me right to it, okay? So I did that and then on line two, it says that I'm gonna discharge that from income, okay? Is that amount. Now, so then you will be taxed on it. Mm -hmm. Now, so that comes over there and that form's gonna go in, but if I look at my 1040 page one on line 21, what's still there? The amount. Like the amount. Here. Yeah, it's still in my income. So this is the way we're gonna do that. I'm gonna go to my worksheet and I'm gonna put in form 982, okay? And they'll know what that is. See on line 18 how I put that in there? And then I'm going to put negative 2541. Okay. Now, if I go back to my 1040 page one, what shows up on line 21? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. So it's the tracks of that now. Exactly. It gets at zero. But if I look at my tree on the left, see where I have my 982 form? Mm -hmm. All right. So the fact that it's over there, all right that will be part of my electronic filing. So even though it doesn't show up on that, this worksheet seven that shows my cancellation of debt and the fact that I'm taking it away, then that will go with my electronic file so they know that I did declare the income, but I don't have to put it in my income, gross income because I'm insolvent. So when it was my said, yes, they, they did say that if I paid it right away, like ADT, mm -hmm. they said, if you pay this today, I'll take $200 off. So will they give me something that says that? No, because that was not really a debt that you had, a personal debt. Okay. So that's kind of a rebate or a discount. Okay. So this is much more for somebody that has a debt, like a loan or a foreclosure on a house or credit card debt is where that 1099C would come in. So it's basically cancellation of debt. It's not, you know, where you get a discount on something that you do in a transaction. All right. So, okay. All right, so we have that. Okay. Yeah. I'm insolvent for twenty five hundred dollars. It's not my nine eighty two. Could mm -hmm. you go back to your form nine eighty two and see if I did it right? My nine eighty two. Yep. Okay. So the nine eighty two here, uh, box one B. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's correct. Just those two places, right? Those were the only two things you had to do. In there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I go back to my uh, form. Um, the worksheet, the 1040 worksheet seven. Thank you. Yep, um, and then I put that in there. Put that down underneath form 982, mm -hmm. negative 2541. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. I already did find it. Now, one thing I want you to note, what I did is I took it out right now. Okay, so if I take that out, yeah, I get that one. Okay. 
Wait, 982. I should get that. How can I get the form? But my form says 2541. Oh, 2541. Mm -hmm. I don't get that. What's that? That's 982 when I get put it in. Oh, no. Okay, go to the next box down where they're insolvent. So on the 982, make sure you're checking that second box. So where it says extent insolvent, discharge of indebtedness to the extent insolvent. Okay, just mm -hmm. okay I put the 2541 there. Mm -hmm. Now, if I go to my 1040 worksheet seven where my 1099C shows up. Mm -hmm. uh, 1040 worksheet seven. So oh. probably, do you have it there 40 where you worksheet. put the cancellation? Okay, so you haven't put the income in yet. Did you put the cancellation of debt in there? Okay. This is where I was. Yep. So if I go to my 1040. Go back to my 1040. Yep. And I go down to line 21. And I can highlight the type box or the, the amount box. And I hit F9. Oh, line which one? Line. 21. Mm hmm. Okay. Yep. So this is the cancellation of debt. Mm hmm. Yeah, because I had 2541 in that. So if I have to go to F9, mm -hmm. and I have to go to which one? The new 1040 worksheet 7? Yep. Okay. So once now I go to that worksheet, then I'll have uh, what should look like that one up there. Correct. I'm going to go line 17. Yep. And I just type in uh, 1099C because there's not anything up above that really gives us a 1099C form, and, and it came from MasterCard. Mm -hmm. 2541. Now, so if you put that in, what I did on the, the one I have up on the board here, I took the Form 982 out. What is the, if it's not in there, what was your refund federal? What did anybody have? If I, I'm only getting zeros. Why are you saying that? On which one? Uh, okay, the, describe. 17, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Oh, okay. So somehow it comes up two here. Yep, we put it in the wrong field. We got to skip that field. Okay. Remember that's so, our taxpayer spouse and okay. Now put it in there. Yep. Twenty five forty one. Yep. There you and go. And now, okay. if I didn't put so, that in there. Yep. If I now, what I want to do is kind of look at this. I want to kind of show you how this works because right now I'm not going to say he's insolvent. So just forget about this one. Okay. okay. So I put that in there. I have what is it? I can't even remember. Seven hundred eighty-three dollars, I think. Seven eighty-three. Yep, and the state is sixty-five. I don't have that. Okay. All right. I have four hundred as my refund, and the state is a negative. Okay, and you got your W two in there. W two right here. The mm -hmm. bonus. And did you get your state withholding down at the bottom? New York State. Okay, we'll go through that in a second here. Okay. okay. So if you look at that, I got a refund of 783, and we'll get yours straightened away here in a second, Marianne, and a state refund of 65. Now, I'm on that uh, worksheet seven. I put in that form 982. I'm going to put that negative 2541 in there. Okay. What'd my refund do? Oh, you know why? Oh, I have to go back to the, get all the worksheets. Right, which I did. Did I do that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I have to add it down. No, that should be zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, 92. Oh, I forgot to check the box there. Check the box. Oh. Put them on there. One up. Oh. One up. One up. One up. Thank you. There you go. Uncheck that other one. Yeah, uncheck that other one. Okay, and then put that amount in there. Minus? Or just nope, just a straight. Yep, 2541. Right. All right, so you have that in there. Yeah. So we got that cleaned up. Nothing I have to do down here. Oh, okay, because you, you try to put it directly on the line. So hold on one oh. second here. 
So on, on line 21, other income, we put the credit card debt on that. What we say is type on, on 1040. There you go. You would uh, oh, see how it was read? Oh, you would type it directly on line 21 as opposed to using the worksheet. Oh, okay. Okay. So that was a good one. What mm -hmm. he's supposed to put it. Yep. Okay. So, so now it's taking it out when I have a bigger refund. Because I went back and. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're line 21. Yeah. Okay, so let's see, you got your worksheet seven. Yeah, so you're good. Yep. Okay. So yeah, so up in the up in the top left, once you do that, it should read. All right, I think I know what's going on here. You should read uh, eleven fifty eight for the federal and two twenty six for the state. So you can see how discharging that debt and saying that you were insolvent saves somebody a whole bunch of money. Line twenty one there, I got to type it. I use a scratch pad. No, you want to hit F nine there. And so you got that worksheet already open? Yeah. So click on that worksheet. And then hit enter. Yeah. Yep, you got it. So it's not going to show up on the 1040 anymore because you made it zero. But this worksheet and the 982 will go in electronically with the return. So it should be zero on line 21 on your oh. 1040. So nothing's going to show up there. there. Exactly. Okay, so. <laughs> so go back to your 1040 page. I know, I know. Yeah, because you yeah. have to see it now. All of a sudden, I had 5,000 in that one that came up as. Let's look at line 21. It came up as 5,082, and I can't get out of that. Okay, so go over to the left. Go to the left. Okay. Yep. Oh, no, nope, right there. Go to the red box. Oh, red box. Yep, click on that. Hit up three. That gets the red out. Okay, now go over, tab to the next box, and hit Shift F8. Shift. Yep. I am that's just over. Right? Yeah. Do it. Oh, hold this hold the shift down, hit F8. I did. Shift F8. I'm on this one. This box, okay. right? Yep, now, now, box. yep. now go to your 1040 week worksheet seven. 1040 worksheet seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't have the 928 in there Not yet. yet. Okay. So, so we'll put the uh, form 928. No. It wants to say form right mm -hmm. now. Did you write that in there? I did. Actually, the 982 is right. I thought so, but yeah. I thought, well, yeah. I'm dyslexic at that. Okay. 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 And tab one over one more. You got go to go Put negative. Ones. I have to put negative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, little thing right there. 25. Yeah. Okay. Now go back to your sheet. Which one? My 1040? Yep. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to say 25. Uh, Yep, so it See, has that. Yep. Go into that field again. Which field? Uh, that one, yep. Mm -hmm. And get rid of that. I can. So, okay, so it's calculated. Okay, so hit Shift F8. Doesn't look at it. Okay. Only let me do it. Do I hit this little guy? No, just hit F8 this time. Just hit plain F8. Okay, put a zero in there. Okay, hit enter. All right. Well, I think it's not how we're supposed to do this. So yeah. I have so. to figure out what I did wrong on that. So okay. one times there is right. Yeah. Yeah, make because sure. Now, that, how much is the refund right now? 1158 and 226? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, make sure on that uh, line 21 that you always go to the worksheet seven. Okay. I, I think what I did was I did a scratch pad because I wasn't sure how to do that. That could be. And I went to scratch pad. Now then I did the nine nine eighty two. Mm -hmm. So now I have two going. So I'm wondering if it registered twice then, because if I go into here, mm -hmm. wait. Oh yeah, you did do a scratch pad. Yes, I did. Okay. Because so I didn't yeah, want to do so it. So go to that scratch pad. And there's this. Yep. So now then remove that form. So go so up on the tab on the top. Tab on top, which is yep. remove just, form. Yep. And it's remove form. Yep. So we're going to get rid of that. There you go. All right, now so go back to 1040 page one, 1040 page one. and yeah. go to line 21. It should be clean. And yep, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So See, like I said, you know, always like make sure that yeah, always make sure that you go into that line 21 and get that worksheet to enter that stuff. Okay. I I'm still on line 21. It's got a red zero. Yes, there's mine. Yep, and, and that's because you typed it in on the line 21 as opposed to doing it on the worksheet 7, and that's fine. So did you... Even though I 
and now have it on the that was originally. Mm -hmm. But now it's on there. So you're fine. But what the reason that it's red, so go back to your 1040 page one and go down to that. Okay, keep going down. Yeah, the reason this is red is because you originally typed on this line. So now it's getting conflicting information. So we're supposed to take it out? It's stay red. Yeah, it, it's fine. It's going to stay red. So that's fine. So, okay. So when you get to line 21, go right to worksheet. You go to the worksheet. Don't type anything directly on line 21. It's kind of like we talked about the Schedule B. Okay. All right. So I'm going to kind of wrap this one up um, as far as Raylene here. Okay. So Raylene, I have all your tax documents. Um, I show your income off your W-2 from Homes or Us. Did you have any interest uh, greater than $10 from any bank accounts? No, um, any dividends from any investments? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, you don't receive any alimony. And I don't see any self-employment or home-based business. No. Uh, did you sell any stock or land or homes for capital gains? No. Did you take any money out of any retirement, pensions, or annuities? No, I did not. Okay. You don't own any rental property. You received no unemployment during 2018, or excuse me, 17? No, I didn't. Okay, and no social security. And we had the miscellaneous income for cancellation of debt. No other miscellaneous income from uh, gambling winnings, jury duty, anything like that? You yeah. didn't win the Powerball this past Friday? No. Okay. Are you paying on any student loans? No, okay. All right. And you don't receive, you didn't pay any alimony to anybody. And uh, did you contribute any money to a retirement account uh, other than what I might see on your W-2 out of your pocket? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, so if I go to page two, I got your standard deductions and your exemptions. Um, I have your tax bill. Um, we talked about that you're not in college. You're not uh, taking any classes or any tuition. Um, did you do anything to your home to make it more energy efficient? Uh, new Energy Star windows, doors, anything like that? No, I didn't. Okay. All right. Not much going on right now, Raylene, is there? Okay. Pretty boring right now. Okay. All right. Uh, so we have some of those. Uh, you're not part of the first time home buyer's credit. That's one that always comes up. Um, we have your tax withheld. Um, you do not qualify for the earned income credit. So I had a tax bill of $4,465 and you had withholding of $5,623. So that means you have a refund today of $1,158, okay? All right, on the state side, we'll go take a look and see what the governor. So you still can get money and still not pay on the other end. As long as uh, there's no lien against your refund that they might take on the other side. Say you still have student loan debt outstanding that we don't have for cancellation or you're behind, right. they might take your refund for that. Okay, or back child support. All right, and you live in Niagara County. I'm on the state side now, the New York 201. Page one. Yep. And uh, let's see, you're in the Newfane School District. Okay. That's uh, kind of the middle section. It's probably lit up red. Yep. And Newfane's 435 is their school code. Okay. Um, you're not hiding any money in the, uh, Cayman Island, Switzerland, or any other foreign countries? No. Okay. And you don't maintain your residence in uh, New York City? No, I don't. Okay. All right. Um, so everything on the state comes over from the federal. Um, we have uh, very much the same. We have a standard deduction again for you. And so we have our tax bill, we have your withholding, and according to the return, uh, the governor owes you $226. Yay. Okay. Would you like that deposited into the same account that we've had it for the federal? Yes, please. Okay. So as you can see right here, I'm uh, kind of down at the direct deposit portion. The first one says I can check the box and it allows me to put it in the same, same account. Are you on page two or something? Page four, New York 201, page four. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, 226. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's gonna go in there, okay. All right, Raylene, do you have any questions? 
No, I'm okay. interested in how I can make this kind of money and I can still have cancellation of debt. Well, like I said, you know, insolvency, it basically saying that you owe more than you own. Okay, so that's that's where we could do that. I uh, have a, that little worksheet that I had you do. Okay. We can't come on after you after that, knowing that you do make money. They might ask you and might ask you to prove it. What we have is, all right, hold on one second. I'm going to show you what I will give my clients. All right, give me one second here. <clears throat> On our website, on the egtax.com website, okay. So give me one second here. Okay. So if I go to our website, okay, and there's a thing called tax and other services. All right, on the right, I put some forms in there. See where it says asset worksheet? Okay. A lot of times I will print, if I can get it open here. Thinking about it. Okay. All right, see that little form there? Basically, it's a little thing for them to go home uh, prior to me doing that, and I have their assets versus their liabilities. So it's, that's not gonna be on your computers, but it's up on the screen there. Um, so that's where, like I said, you can go through that, and I can ask them to list all the things that they have that would be assets, and then all the liabilities of all the things that they own. Oh, I should say. So if that's the case, and they come out with a surplus, let's say $1,000. You subtract that off of the 20 some hundred, so they nope. have to pay it? This is just proven insolvency. So if their assets are greater than liabilities by $1,000, no, then they're not insolvent. So then what do you do with that cancellation of debt? They can't do it. They, so they have to pay tax on it. Mm -hmm. So then you have to add it as income. Yep, so it's straight income. The you whole thing, yes. even if it's 1,000 versus the 2,000 they have on cancellation of debt. You don't subtract 1,000 off They have $2,541 as cancellation of debt. Correct. And if they're, oh, so they have to be 3,500 in the game. No. The only way they can cancel the debt is if they're insolvent. And this is two separate things. You're, you're trying to add them together. Okay, right. okay. This is proving insolvency. So if this comes up where their net balance is negative, they owe more than they own, then they're insolvent. Then, and then they're insolvent. I can go back and take the whole amount off of that debt. It doesn't matter how insolvent, how much insolvent they are, I can take the whole amount. So, you know, that's where that, yeah. So yeah, you're trying to add them together. Well, I'm trying to say if they're not insolvent, then you have to take that amount and add it as income. It was a foreclosure. No. You foreclosed on the house. Mm -hmm. So that means that it was $50,000 home mm -hmm. and we took it back. Mm -hmm. That's $50,000 that you actually was a cancellation debt. It is, and you have to show that as income, but in the case of a foreclosure on the 982, you may be able to exclude that. Interesting. Yeah, and that, and that you know, the 982 had a lot more liberal use when we were going through all the foreclosure stuff. You guys still do a lot more due diligence on it, but it's still the case that you can do that. Okay. So, but yeah, that, so on our, and it'll be on your desktops and stuff like that, but like I said, the asset worksheet is there to prove that they're insolvent. They don't, the amount of insolvency doesn't have anything to do with the cancellation of debt. They're two solely separate numbers, okay? It's just for us a way to prove that they're insolvent so that we can wipe out that cancellation of debt, that $2,541 in this case, okay? But they're separate, all right? So even if they're only insolvent by $1,000, that means they're insolvent. So we can take care of that, okay? You're insolvent if your debt is more than your Yes. Yep. So can I ask you what it might send this me grade school? He said a ton of student loan debt. Mm -hmm. And he's got, you know, almost nothing. Is he insolvent? Um, he probably would be if he had cancellation of debt. If he I mean if he had it, but he, but yeah. 
So say that he had a credit card that he couldn't pay off and he settled for $1,000 less than what he owed. So if, there's a lot of people that are technically insolvent right now. Because of student loans. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. kind of up to the person that you owe the debt to whether they're going to cancel your oh, debt yeah. or not. Oh, yeah. You know, that's where these calls and stuff, right, trying to settle the debt on everything. So, but like I said, anytime you're forgiven, you're forgiven debt, there's a good chance you're going to get a 1099-C for cancellation of debt. Okay, now on the opposite side, the one that canceled the debt, how, what do they do? Do they say that I can deduct, I have a deduction now of that $2,500? So MasterCard? Yeah, that's an expense for them. Then it'll be an expense. Mm -hmm. It'll be yeah. lost for it's that, loss. even though the other side can't take it as a gain. Mm -hmm. So the loss lost. lost. Mm -hmm. With these advertisements where they, you know, you owe the IRS, we can get it, you know, down to pennies on a dollar. Mm -hmm. it, one is if that's true, then, then do they... The forgiveness of tax, tax debt? Then, yeah, then... That doesn't show up as income. Okay. Yeah. That's a little bit different. It may, but it's a little bit different. So... Yeah, then, then tax you on it. You're going to get you one way or the other, right? right? Jim's thinking, now, wait a second. I don't have to pay tax on it, but now they forgave me my tax debt. Now they're going to make me pay tax on it. Yeah. So, all right. Okay. So we're going to take five minutes. Okay. So we just did chapter four uh, and we did a problem there with unearned income. Uh, one thing, did everybody bring their little New York state no. Okay, let me put it up on the board. Okay, uh, let's see here, New York State. Okay, so um, just a couple things I want to point it out in New York, that kind of things that we've talked about. Um, we kind of did a little bit on the problem, um, just like the federal on the state, we're gonna use their regular form, the IT-201, their resident income tax form. So we're gonna do that. Um, we talked about the fact that they ask about the state. Uh, the biggest thing I want you to notice is that the first section, and we saw this, that it says federal income and adjustments. So basically page one of the federal 1040 comes right over to New York State, okay? It likes to use all the income it can in New York State to create tax in New York State. Okay, all right, so it's gonna use your federal. Okay, so we have it on that. Um, we'll talk about some of the adjustments and things later. Um, on, uh, so this is the beginning of your little book here. Your one's on there. Um, talks about New York State full residence. Uh, we've gone through this before about who must file. Um, if you filed a federal return, obviously the state wants its share. Okay, we do live in a state that likes to tax, so it wants its share. All right, you do not have to file a federal return, but your federal adjusted gross income for 2017 plus New York additions was more than 4,000. Okay, 3,100 if you are single and can be claimed as a dependent on another taxpayer's federal return. So the filing threshold for the state is pretty low, isn't it? Especially for that uh, that dependent, that college student that's uh, working, that's uh, dependent on your returns, working at Tim Hortons and making five thousand dollars. You know, thirty one hundred is their standard deduction. Okay, on the federal. All right, what's their standard deduction? Sixty three. Yeah, give or take. Yep. But on the state, it's about half of that. So this is where we see a lot of dependents on their parents' return when they get done at the end of the year that they owe money on the state side, all right? Just because the standard deduction is so low for a dependent. And the other thing that happens too is, a lot of times they're working a job where they're make, be making $275 or less a week. That doesn't trigger any state withholding. So by the time it's all said and done, a lot of them owe from anywhere from 50 to $250, okay? What advice I always give to the dependent is, when you fill out that little paperwork form, make sure that you check single zero and have them automatically take $5 out no matter what. Can you do negative one? No. So you have <laughs> that you don't exist? Well, so they take out more. No, you have to do it as the standard amount. So 
So, so when, is the lowest. Rate. Lowest, yeah, that's the lowest uh, allowance you can go. The only other, and a lot of people, you know, especially on the other end of the spectrum, people that have higher income that are always worried, they'll claim single zero and they may have them taken out an additional $100 every paycheck so that they kind of really max it out. Okay, so they add, yeah, so you have to add it as a dollar amount. You can't go below zero on the exemptions. So, okay. Although, I don't know, you could try. I don't, I don't know if there's a withholding table for that, though. I think it only goes to zero. So I don't do payroll, but I would assume that it stops at zero. I don't know if there's a withholding table of negative one. Oh, so if you do zero, it won't match you to the $100, let's say. Maybe it was only $5 you're supposed to take out. Yeah. On it won't match up. Yeah. And this is where a lot of times I'll see people that'll do on the state, and you always have to double check it. They'll do um, single zero plus an extra $10. And the person that's typing it in will go single and then they won't skip and hit zero and go to the $10. They'll put single 10. They forget to put the $10 as a dollar amount. So then their withholding allowances is 10 and they have no money taken out. And they come and see me at the end of the year and says, guess what? You owe the state $1,100. What? I had them taking the maximum plus 10. Nope. They, whoever typed it in, typed 10 in the allowance square. So moral story is in this day and age, always make sure you get a copy somewhat of your pay stub. They're electronic, you gotta log in, you gotta do this, you still gotta look at them, okay? All right, uh, non-residents, that's the IT203. Um, so, you know, if we're not um, residents or we're splitting or whatever or moved in, there's some things that we'll do there. Um, this goes back a couple years, but that's already done with the same-sex marriage, okay? Well, it used to be that it uh, wasn't recognized in the state, so we had to do the return separately and then put them together, but those, it's now recognized in the state of New York, same-sex marriage is married filing joint, so it's just the same. But it used to be that you had to file the federal and then go change the state to do them separate. So, which was a lot of fun, trying to keep that straight, okay? Uh, like I said, the, the considerations here, um, you know, that we have the little book, it just talks about things. Um, on the top of the page 12 in there, there's a little thing that has the standard deductions. Um, so you can see those on there. Um, a lot of times the, the threshold's a little lower. Uh, when we get into itemized, I'll make sure to show you how the state itemized is calculated, okay? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we wanted to hit here yet. Um, Uh, the exemption on the state side for each of the dependents is $1,000 on the state, okay? So again, when somebody releases that, uh, you know, in the case of a divorce or separation decree, when they're leasing, releasing the federal exemption, it's also the state exemption, okay? And then a lot of things that we have that were um, on the federal for adjustments to income, when we talk about those, will come over, Okay. All right, so I just want to kind of interject a little bit of that. So we'll kind of, I kind of keep giving you references to go to the small book about the New York State uh, so that we make sure to follow along. All right. Okay. Chapter five. Now we get into the fun stuff. Okay. Like I said, um, I think I had told you um, this is where you make notes if you want to make it on your syllabus. But uh, refundable credits, okay, those are the Energizer Bunny, all right? Refundable credits, those are the ones that you get. And once you get them and your tax bill is gone, they still keep on going and going and going, all right? So I want you to picture that Energizer Bunny. So even if I've gotten rid of all of my tax bill, I may still have a refundable credit where I still have it add to my refund or add to my withholding even though my tax bill may have disappeared, okay? So that's where those refundable credits can be very important, okay? All right, uh, what we're gonna talk about is the difference between a tax deduction, so we're at the bottom of 5.3, and a tax credit, okay? Those are two different things. Uh, we're gonna understand and talk about a little bit more about non-refundable, which is Pac-Man. Once all the little dots are eaten up, what happens to the Pac-Man? He stops. He doesn't move, okay? Unless one of the ghosts is chasing him, I guess. Am I dating myself? Mm -hmm. so, 
Did they have a Pac-Man machine at the uh, Blue Whale? I don't know. I, don't, I just saw it. No video games there? Okay. No. All right. The Blue Whale car wash, and they didn't have the old Pac-Man machine? No. Do they? I was always partial. I was always partial to Frogger. I like Frogger. So, yeah, you know, everything's retro, right? Um, we're going to talk about tests for the earned income credit. And again, I stress the words earned income credit. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about the additional child tax credit, uh, American Opportunity credit, uh, the premium tax credit, which is kind of some of the healthcare stuff that we'll do later in Chapter 16. And we're going to talk about some of that excess Social Security and undistributed capital gains. Don't see a lot of that, so we'll touch on it just a little bit, okay? Now, this is a good portion to talk about where deduction versus tax credit, okay? All right, so, yep, we're in the textbook. Yep, textbook five, chapter five. Yep, not in the workbook, yep. The big fat one. So, all right. Too many books going on, right, Jim? All right. Wait till I start throwing the QuickBook Finder and the textbook and all the other stuff in on you. All right. So when we talk about, if you look at the example, we're going to use these numbers kind of as example to follow along for the difference between a deduction and a credit. As it says there, we have Jackie, John and Jackie are two unmarried taxpayers filing status as single. Jackie earns more than John. So she pays not only a total tax of the 20,000 versus whatever, but her income tax is taxed at a higher rate than John's, 20 versus 10. So if we look at that, we see their adjusted gross income, we see their taxable income, and then her tax rate is 10%. You know, we're not really adding anything in, and his is, or, uh, his is 10%, hers is 20%. So it's pretty straightforward. The math is pretty simple there, okay? Now, if we have a deduction, okay, and again, a deduction is coming off of our income, all right? So remember, deductions go with income, all right? So if we look there, they each had a $500 deduction that lowered John and Jackie's taxable income, okay? Now, tax due is calculated on taxable income, and then we have the tax that they would pay. So if you look at that, you know, it's not a dollar for dollar. Deductions are never dollar for dollar in what we owe, okay? It's a portion. So if you look at the deduction savings of $50, so that $500 only saved us $50 on our tax return. So those are deductions, okay? All right, okay. So it says, as there, it says in the help box at the bottom of 5.4, a tax deduction saves only a percentage of the deduction amount. It's not a dollar for dollar, okay? Now, let's go back and we're gonna to go to the top of five five and we're gonna kind of talk about a similar scenario. We started out with that effective rate, okay? Now, in this case, we got a tax credit and that's what we're gonna talk about, these refundable and non-refundable credits. No deduction, so we calculated the tax, the credit comes off the tax. Okay, so deduction off of income, credit off of tax. So you can see that that credit is much more, as a greater effect or is much more beneficial when it's on that because now we can, you know, John cut his tax bill in half. Okay, Jackie, you know, she just lowered it by 500. So you can see how the credits maybe work different depending on your income and your tax. All right. Okay, so as it says in the help box, generally a tax credit saves 100% dollar for dollar of the credit amount. So that savings on your taxes is dollar for dollar value of the credit, okay? So that's why credits, we spend so much time on them because basically once we've calculated the tax bill, now we gotta figure out how to get rid of it if we can, okay? All right. At the top of five, six, non-refundable tax credit, those are Pac-Man versus refundable tax credit, Energizer Bunny. Pac-Man stops when the tax bill's done. Refundable keeps going on and on and on even after the tax is taken care of, okay? So we have that, all right? 
So as it says there, if the tax credit is more than the total tax due, the ta this is non-refundable, the tax due is reduced to zero, but any excess credit is lost. So it's not the fact when we have a non-refundable, we don't get to, to carry it anywhere else, all right? Refundable credit, if there's any left over after the tax is reduced, we get it, okay? So that's always a good thing, all right? We have our little example there between uh, John and Jackie, and we have that the fact that they have their income, again, as it starts out, uh, we have a non-refundable tax credit, all right? So, as you can see there on John, because his tax, due, tax bill due was smaller, that non-refundable credit, he only got $100, $800 of it. Whereas Jackie, because her income was higher, got a full thousand. Now, keep in mind, and I'm just gonna throw this in as a little bit of a confusing factor, some of these credits have phase out. So if you think of it kind of like a bell curve, lower income or tax bill kind of comes up, maxes out. On the other side, as your income reaches a certain threshold or certain point, then that credit can decrease again and you don't get it if your income is really high. Best example um, with the new laws versus the changes. Um, 2017, the child tax credit um, phases out between uh, for married filing joint at $110,000. It starts to phase out. So if we have a mom and dad and make over $110,000, they don't get the full thousand dollar child tax credit under the 17 law. Okay. Under the 2018 law, the child tax credit's $2,000, but the phase out doesn't happen until $400,000. So for all these people that lost the child tax credit in previous years that have kids under the age of 17, they're now gonna get that credit back. Of 2,000 a kid. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it is a non-refundable credit. Well, I should take that back. The 2,000, there is 600 of it is non-refundable. 1,400 is refundable. So even at that threshold. So say we have somebody that is very savvy and they make high income and they're able to wipe out their tax bill somehow, um, they would still get $1,400 per child, even after the, uh, if they have no tax bill. You had a question, Jim? And that went up to 400,000, that the threshold? That out. phase out. So when, you know, it used to be when you hit 110,000, you lost the child, or started to lose the child tax credit. Now it's 400,000. So there's a lot of people that have been brought back in the middle class that are still going to get to be able to use the child tax credit that didn't get to use it previous year. So, so that's one of the good things. <clears throat> All right, so we see that on there, and that's so that's kind of where that non-refundable credit talks about, okay? All right, and then if we have a refundable credit, all right, we can see there that uh, if you go on the page, uh, let's see, we're on page five, six. All right, so refundable tax credit is used to reduce the taxpayer's tax due. So let's see how that $1,000 works out, okay? Well, John's case, before when we had a non-refundable, so I'm on the top of page five, seven. Before we had that, um, that uh, refundable credit of 1,000, John left $200 on the table, didn't he? But now, if it's a refundable credit, he gets that 200. So that's why I say the Energizer Bunny, he still gets it, it's not lost, okay? In Jackie's case, it doesn't really change anything, does it? Because as you have higher income, chances are you're still gonna have a tax bill no matter what, all right? Okay, so like I said, the big thing I want you to take away from this is Non-refundable, Pac-Man, okay? All right, refundable, Energizer Bunny. We may get it even after, okay? Deduction relates to income. Credit relates to tax bill, okay? So that's where they're gonna affect things, all right? The first credit we're gonna talk about is the earned income credit, okay? The infamous earned income credit. This is one that you have to make sure you understand how they qualify because this is a huge credit 
for those uh, mid to low income families, um, whether it be married, filing joint, had a household with children or qualifying children, I should say. Do you get a lot of them? There's quite a few. Yeah. And it depends on the office you work in. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't, uh, you know, uh, I don't see as many um, at the corporate office because I'm doing different types of returns there as I did when I was here in Lockport. Okay. It just all depends. And then there's families. The thing too, when we talk about the earned income credit is that if you have unearned income above a certain threshold. So if I'm in an office where the W-2 income is low, but they still have rental properties. If that rental income is above a certain level, that unearned income, then they're not eligible for the earned income credit, even though their W-2 income may say that they are. So that's a whole different ballgame because that's a tough one to explain to anybody. What do you mean? I only made 15000 No, you made 4000 on your uh, rental properties that is under an income above a certain threshold and you're not eligible for their income credit. Yeah, yeah your net income. Yep. Yep. Bottom line. You know, so that's where a lot of people don't understand. And then they may turn around and say, well, actually I rented it to my, um, you know, sister. It's a duplex and I rented my sister and I just rented, you know, I don't, I lose money on it. I just rent her for my cost. Okay. Then you got to declare the whole rent as income because if somebody rents, to somebody, they have to declare that income one way or the other. It's just the bad deal is if you're renting below market value, you're gonna have to show that as income probably on line 21. You have deductions. Nope. Because it's a if you're renting below fair market value, yeah, if you're renting below the market value, so if I have an apartment that's right above this and my neighbors are renting for $1,000. I'm renting below fair market value. I can't take the losses and create a big loss on my return because I'm not getting fair market. So you just that 500 bucks is income. Straight income. No, Straight income. You can't take any expenses like Marianne was saying. So I can't take property tax, mortgage interest, utilities, nothing against it. Does the renter have to claim that at all, that they're getting below? Getting no. Cheaper? You mean the difference? Yeah. No, they just have to claim the income. So, with well, the rent. The person renting the apartment. Oh, the person renting the apartment? No. no as, as if it's like a cancellation of forgiveness or something below it? Yeah, or just that they're getting more for their money. No, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that's just lucky them. Lucky yeah. them. Yep. Okay. Leaves them more to buy uh, Mega Millions tickets. Okay. So, all right. So, like that's right. That's right. Yep. Wait till, <laughs> wait till they come to their landlord and says, hey, I want to buy your building and yeah. any other ones that you own. So, and uh, if anybody's interested, I did see this morning, I heard somebody talking about there is a island off the coast of Florida called Pumpkin Key that is for sale, uh, $95 million. So if you do win, you can buy your own island. Oh, yeah. we'll set up an Yep, there you go. <laughs> well, it's, it, you're going to have to buy a shuttle boat because it's, it's kind of away from the coast. How are you going to get your clients there? Are you going to boat them over there? or just uh, If I win the bank, well. All the ones on the cruise. Yep, yeah. I'll, I'll figure out the logistics on that one. Yep, yep. Jim's going to have a little boat dock. He's going to be doing tax returns sitting on a boat dock. There you go. Okay. All right. So, but uh, the earned income credit, as it says here, it is a refundable tax credit for certain people who work and have less than $53,930 of earned income filing status, married, filing joint, okay? That's quite a bit of income. Now, it doesn't mean that it's a flat rate. It's not like the child tax credit. This is a thing that's it's kinda, as the income's low, and then it goes up, kinda reaches a plateau, and then diminishes till it disappears at around the 53,000 mark, okay? It's not really a bell curve like you think of. This one has a flat top, okay? Um, yeah, when you look at the earned income chart, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you're in there, you know, you get to, if you're, um, as I talked about, that single person that we were talking about earlier, you know, if that person, um, anybody between 6750 or excuse me, $6,650, this is a single person, no children or anything, um, and all the way up to 8350 they get the same amount of earned income credit. It doesn't keep increasing and then decreasing. That's where the plateau is, okay? So they will get exactly the same. 
Um, married filing joint um, with one child. Okay. Pretty much you reach the plateau. Uh, let's see here. The plateau is at about 10,250. Okay. And the person gets $3,400. And that's pretty much the plateau all the way through 23,000. So for married filing joint with one child between those two incomes, everybody gets the same. So like I said, it's got a flat top, it's got a plateau. And everybody kind of reaches a plateau at a certain point, okay? So, and then the example that they have here, the person that's making $53,930, okay? If it's married filing joint and they are making $53,930 and they have three kids, their earned income credit is $3. Okay, so it's not like anybody that's making 53 is going to get thousands of dollars earned income credit. They're getting three, and as long as they have three kids. If they have two kids, they get nothing. So what happens if it's 50,597? You have two qualifying children. It's still three dollars. It is. What was that amount? 50. 50,597. Your married filing joint. Two qualifying children. 2,597, uh, nope. What is it? Zero. It's zero. Mm -hmm. So that extra child gave you how much money? $99? Uh, so if you have two kids, you get zero. If you have three kids, you get $700. $700. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, it's a, it's a, yeah, well, it's a tough one because like I said, you know, it reaches a plateau. It's not like as you make more earned income, the more you get of that credit. It goes up, flattens off, and then goes down pretty sharply, okay? Because it doesn't take much to go down there, all right? Um, there's a little chart there that says earned income credit in a nutshell, and it has rules for everyone, all right? And again, you look at this, these are all rules that are ands. There's no gray area in this one. This is one that the IRS will pick on and scrutinize as far as fraud. It's its number one fraud area. And this is where we see when kids are being claimed by more than one parent, and it's a race to see who gets there first. You know, it's the child tax credit and the earned income credit, especially if we have two incomes that are pretty low, okay? All right. To, uh, at the top of five nine, it talks about the rules for everyone. All right. What about your investment income of thirty four fifty? Um, is that just like an interest? It can be like interest on mortgages and all that that you receive. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Any unearned income. Any unearned. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any unearned income. Um, you know, your investment income must be thirty four fifty or less. Prime example. <clears throat> um, my father is no longer alive, so it's my uncle and I. We're part owners of a farm in Nebraska. And we have rental income from that farm, okay? So as soon as my rental income that's coming in from that farm is above 3450, earned income credit's off the table for me. That's why I say investment income, when you see that, don't just think of you know, interest and dividends on in stocks. What else is investment income? Rentals, yeah, rentals. Yep, those are investment property, all right? Yeah, yep, things that would come around a K-1 from a partnership or a corporation. Yep, anytime you get that unearned income that's above that 3450, chances are you've taken the EIC off the table. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, okay? And I don't know why on that char chart at the bottom of 5.8 that they leave number seven to the words, you must have earned income. Okay, unemployment, retirement, Social Security, those are not earned income as we've learned, okay? So you, for this credit, you have to have earned income. How about disability? Work? Nope, that's unearned. So is that why, yeah, the no qualifying child stops at 65 when you figure people who get Social Security so they wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to mm -hmm. get it anyway. Yep, yep. So if they don't have a W-2, they can't get it. 
Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Self employment. Ten ninety nines. Yeah. Well, ten ninety nines depends. You know, it depends if it's um. It, it, but you that's earned income because you're self employed. Okay. If it was a ten ninety nine for other income that you did not earn, then that's different. Okay. So yeah, ten ninety nine. You got to be. You know, what box is it in? If it's a ten ninety nine miscellaneous and it shows up in the rents box, is that earned income? No. That's investment income. But that non-employee compensation, as soon as I hear the words compensation, that means that you got paid for something that you did. Yeah, so, okay. So my mega millions wouldn't necessarily throw me out of this until I got to just the course. Um, yeah. If I could figure out. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, yes, if you win the mega millions, you're not going to qualify for the earned income. Two reasons your income is probably too high, and the second, that is unearned income. Okay. I know you may have worked hard on picking those numbers, Jim, and labored over them, and you stood in line for two hours to buy your ticket. That doesn't mean you earned it. Okay. All right. Okay, so at the top of 5.9, it talks about the rules. To qualify, the taxpayer must have earned income, be working. I don't know how else to say this. The value of the credit varies depending on the income level and the number of qualifying children. All right? These are rules for everyone. There is no exceptions. There's no if, ands, or buts. Okay? AGI must be less than certain amounts. Must have a valid Social Security number. Okay? Uh, filing status cannot be married filing separate. Hmm. So there's one of our first things we're going, this is a big credit. And if it gets taken off the table and somebody goes, I can't figure out why. And that's, remember I told the story about filing status. You know, if I had to send one to the parking lot and bring them in separately, um, that may be a reason because the household where the kids reside, I want to make sure that we have income and refunds or where those kids so if they can't get along and they do married filing separate, they may owe money because the earned income credit's probably off the table, okay? Must be a U.S. citizen, cannot file a form 2555, which is foreign income. As we talked about, in, investment income must be less than 3450 and must have earned income. I don't know how many times this is going to be in here, okay? Uh, goes through there. Again, you know, if grandma and grandpa are over the age of 65 and they're claiming grandkids, they don't get the earned income credit either. Okay. All right. Once you're 65. Yep. Yep. Once you're 65. Yep. Yep. Nothing there. Okay. Um, so there's really no like, gray areas figured out. No. Yes. No. No. And that's where, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, you know, and we kind of went over it and I said, we come back to it. That whole 88 or the due diligence form that I talked about that's four pages long that has all the little red boxes that you got to answer the questions. When you start reading those, you're going, hmm, this must be really important, this earned income credit. Because about every question is asking you a question. Did they live with you? Are they your kids biological? Can you prove this? So, all right. Okay. Uh, top of 510, we have some EIC examples. All right. Okay, and it talks about that earned income. We got John and Janet Smith are married and file a return. They have one child, Amy, who is three years old. Amy lived with John and Janet. John worked and earned 95. Janet uh, worked and earned 1,500. So their earned income is $11,000. So they qualify for the earned income credit, okay? So they have to do the schedule EIC to see if they qualify. All right, so we have their earned income, as it says down there. Um, we get their earned income credit. So the following line across the column that described the filing status, number of children, find 3,400. Remember that number I kind of threw out there? Married filing joint with one. All right, so, you know, those tables are a little few places. I always have it, you know, I've told you about the little reference book. It's one of the tabs right there in the front. Um, you know, even if their income climbed to, let's see here, they're at 34. Even if their income climbed to uh, $23,950 from the 11,000 they have, they'd still have the same earned income credit, 3,400. Yep, so if you look at the table, it just stays at 3,400. That's that plateau, okay? 
All Can right. You label them on this program? No. No. Yep. That pub, yeah, Pub 17. It's, yep, Pub 17 has it in there. So um, there's a little EIC, the due diligence, or not the due diligence, the little EIC uh, worksheet, the schedule there on the page 511. And you can see it talks about Amy and child social security number. If you don't have a child social security number, it doesn't work. Child's year of birth, there we got the age. It asks you, was the child under 24 at the end of the year a student and younger than you? The answer is no. Then you can go to the next one. Was the child permanently and totally disabled during any part of 2017? Yes. Okay, so even if that's yes and the child's 25, there might be an earned income credit. Okay. Um, they'll scrutinize this one. You may have to get a note from the doctor or something from uh, social services or whatever that says they have been qualified disabled. If, if they're nine years old and they, uh, as a disability, they get more. Mm -hmm. So the only reason no. why you want to check off yes then is if they're going to research. Yeah, if they're nine years old and disabled, chances are they might be getting social security disability in their name and their social security number. It doesn't show up on the parent's return and they wouldn't have to file because social security disability is not taxable. Okay, so you know that's where that might come into play, but um, yeah, at nine years old, they wouldn't add anything because of social security disability. And the parents don't have to claim it as income for their child on their tax return as income? The social security disability for the child, if it's in the child's social security number. Okay. All right, um, they got a relationship. And then the number of months, uh, residency. A lot of things, remember back to our um, qualifying child rules? You know, all those things are on that qualifying child rules as far as those questions. And, you know, you have to answer them and make sure that all of this is, you know, correct, okay? Um, on the next page there on 512, it shows in the EIC worksheet, you know, basically that's the calculation that they're talking about, okay? All right, um, we have another example there on page 513, um, 1040EZ. She's a full-time student. She lived with her parents. She had a part-time job and earned 6240. She earned $20 in interest on savings account. All right, and she can't be claimed as a dependent on her parents. All right, because she doesn't meet the age test and she has no children. All right. So it says we enter earned income. She goes to her income uh, credit table and in, uh, the instructions. She finds her earned income and it shows that she would get $476, okay? And again, this is where sometimes um, college kids think that, you know, filing and not being a mom and dad's, ooh, look, I got an extra $476 earned income credit. Well, you know, it, when you look at the impact on the parents, it's far greater than what they may get because that's a pretty minimal credit there, okay? All right, so again, just tables kind of showing you what, uh, what uh, is calculated there, okay? All right, um, we have a little eligibility thing there. <clears throat> okay, page 515, all right? Ethics of refundable credits. Due diligence promotes accurate refundable credit claims. Incorrect tax returns and failure to comply with the due diligence requirements can adversely affect you, the taxpayer, and our tax preparer, excuse me, and your client. Basically, don't do it, okay? As you read through here, if you fraudulently take an EIC or child tax credit, what is it? Yeah, you know, you lose it for 10 years. So imagine if you got caught when the child's seven years old, and for 10 years, your income would dictate that you would get that earned income credit. And if it was minimal, you know, you just lost $50,000, and also now they're 17 and they leave home. Okay? You know, that, that's a lot of money. But again, you know, it, it, is, it is a big area of fraud with uh, tax returns. You just have to do your due diligence on this, okay? 
have to ask all those questions. As it says at the bottom of 515, just know your EIC tax laws thoroughly, evaluate your client's information, ask the right questions, and document the questions as you ask your child's answers, okay? We have it such that, um, you know, we have scanners in all the offices um, that if they bring something in, we put it on file because we don't want any gray area, all right? And how's the old proverb go? If it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck? It's a duck. It's a duck, okay? Mm -hmm. And what I mean is if something just doesn't feel right, do that extra due diligence, okay? If the client understands that you're doing your job, they should have no problem. But if there seems to be something where all of a sudden they don't want to give information or they get very defensive, okay? Especially when we're talking residency. Where do they live? Okay, that's fine. You can claim this child. You have to prove that they live with you. Well, they do, okay? And I've had instances where, as I've said, you need to go get something that's a letter from the school that shows your name and their name with the, your address on it. And they'll come in, say, here it is. And I said, but this is not your address. Well, that's where their mail goes, okay? I can't accept this. I have to prove residency. You gotta find something else. You know, because maybe the mail goes to mom's house, but they live with dad. Well, that letter doesn't prove residency for me. And me as a tax preparer, and, you know, for Esther and EG tax, the potential liability, if we just, because this is one of those credits that we're printing money. So if you've had people say, well, then never mind. And oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's going to get more and more. Mm -hmm. Divorce rates up. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, oddly enough, we did have an instance where somebody, uh, remember I said that there can't be two head of households? Uh, somebody tried to file at one office as head of household with one child and somebody went to a different office and tried to file as head of household with the other child and they both lived in the same house and they're both their kids, but they weren't married. So what's that tell you? Okay, I was gonna say, that's who delivers our office supplies. I was like, we're not open yet. Um, so, you know. So does your soft, do the, the software catch it? I mean. How would you? Yeah. Because there's nothing really compares the filing status, but eventually the IRS is going to catch up to it. Two separate people. So yeah. Went, yeah. Usually they wouldn't go to the same person. Yeah. That's why I say they went to two different offices. Right. 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 IRS would catch it with a personal social security number, right? I mean, no, because they, you know, you had one kid with one social security oh. number and one kid with another. They kind of split the house. By address. Have the same address, there can't be two out of By right, yeah, they're eventually going to catch up to them. Right. Yeah. And like I said, that's why there's such a big area of fraud. How did, <clears throat> and that happened? Mm -hmm. that actually, and how did you find out that it actually happened? Uh, just we exchanged messages during the tax season. And sometimes, like I said, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, at least throw it out there. And it's a, a instant messaging thing that goes to all the offices. Hey, heads up. You know, it seems like, you know, because they may see that claiming the second child doesn't gain them anything, so then they'll pull back on the child. And you're thinking, okay, who's going to take this child now? Right. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because they say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just hold on to that one. Well, no, they live with you. We'll put them on the return. No, no, that's fine. I'll just hold on to that. So obviously you know, somebody else is going to claim them for something. Right. And that's where you got to say, okay, is there somebody else claiming this child? And if they say, yeah, my girlfriend, where does she live? She lives with me. Okay. Then you both can't be head of household. Somebody has got to be providing more than half the support or upkeep of the home. So, okay. All right. So the one we are doing uh, single with one dependent, the other one being head of household with one dependent. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, could they still both get the earned income credit then? Yeah, but obviously the single person filing status is going to be less than the head of household. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if I look here, like if I have $16,500, okay, um, that's probably not a good example. Um, I'm on the plateau. So let me go. Okay, so if I have 
Um, I'm making $29,000 and I have one child, okay? If I'm doing single or head of household, I get the same amount of credit there, okay? But what else comes into play? Single and head of household has much different what? Standard deduction or tax tables too. Okay, so the earned income are maybe the same, but they're kind of maxing things out there. But like I said, for the earned income credit status, you just got to make sure that it's filed correctly. Okay. But that's legal. They both can take one child earned income credit. One will have had a house call. One will be single. One will get a little bit less mm -hmm. standard deduction than the other. That's mm -hmm. okay. But they can get earned income both. Of them. Yeah, but the chances are, if they're unmarried, living together. Um, What's one of the things for tiebreaker for head of household? Who's a go-to? A higher income, doesn't it? Why would that be? Think about what we just talked about. Why would they give the kids in a tiebreaker to the person with the higher adjusted gross income? It would get them further down onto the tax deductions? Yeah. Think about what we're, the credit we're talking about. The earned income. Right? Yeah. So if you have higher income, what's your... What's your earned income credit? Well, less. 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 Right, that's what I'm saying, I'll bring it down. So see, it, see the thought process? Yeah, so if you're, you know, on a check like that, if there's a tiebreaker based on income, they're always gonna give it to the higher, why? Because then the earned income credit's off the table. You know, one of their areas of fraud. Yeah. They're not gonna do it in your favor, they do it in their favor. Exactly, they're not gonna say, well, we'll give the kids to the lower income so that it can get the earned income credit. Okay. All right. So that's the earned income credit um, on the top of pi 516. This is the due diligence, the form 8867. Okay. Like I said, get every documentation you can. Something that shows that they live with you, that they um, reside, that they're biologically. Like I said, when somebody comes in and they're single parent, filing head of household, and they have three social security numbers, or three social security cards and all three kids have different last names, I gotta ask. I mean, I, I'm not judging the person, but I have to ask, are they yours? I need to see birth certificates that has your name and their name on it, okay? Because right now it's not, you know, because their last names are different than yours. Oh, they're my kids, they're just, you know, three different dads. Well, I, I have to see, you know, relationships. That's my due diligence because if I give it to them and it comes back and they get in trouble, I'm going to get in trouble because my name and credentials are on that tax return. Okay. All right. And I don't mean to be daddy more bucks and be mean and say, this is the rules that you live in the house by and holler at you. Okay. I'm just saying, you just got to do your due diligence on this. Um, like I said, records, things like that. It shows the 8867. Um, we kind of went through it um, when we did the things and I told you to check those red boxes and read what you're answering yes or no to. So like if they bring in their person, do you scan it and then can you attach it like that file? So we just keep it electronically. We don't have to send it in, but we just keep it electronically and that, that we have to keep it for three years on that. So for the rules and trust me, you know, we get letters all the time where people come in with letters saying they've been disallowed the earned income credit we have to prove, and we're not just getting birth certificates. There's about four different categories that they have to provide documentation. You know, they got a social security card, the birth certificate, something from a school or a doctor that shows the residents and that they live with them, proof of their income. I mean, they make them jump through hoops if they have a doubt. In it. And that may be where you were talking about where it may be the case that, you know, the household, there's some parameter, or in the case where two people try to claim the same child and the returns get and then they decide to send them in paper well now the IRS has two returns with the same child for an earned income credit on them. they're going to figure out who's going to win you know then you have to put custody papers in there to show who actually is the custodial parent and where they live I mean you know they're really going to put them through the ringer it's about eight pages the IRS sends you with a list of stuff on there okay um, on the top of 519, we talked about some of those things that we scan in, uh, school records or statements, those are good. The thing is, they're not as good as they used to do, because just like pay stubs, what have all the schools gone to? Portals. 
you log in to get your kids grades it probably just has their name their grade and their teacher on it and their grades doesn't show their address and doesn't show the parents name anymore because they're not mailing at home remember you used to get your kids report card in the window it said to the parents of you know all right uh, landlords if they're listed on the lease um, health care provider might be the insurance or even their health card if the names are on there talked about medical records child care I've had that one where somebody's come in and said well here's proof and the address doesn't match because the name and the child's name and the address on the health care or on the uh, dependent care didn't match who was trying to claim the child so somebody else was paying for dependent care but they were trying to claim the child okay uh, placement agency social services records are a great one because chances are if we have somebody that's of lower income and they're doing social services where they may be not only they're an income credit but maybe they're getting uh, snap or meal assistance uh, the kids are getting wick um, they might be getting social or uh, heap or something like that those forms list the members of the household and it lists the parents, their address, and the members of the household. So those are great. Uh, place of worship, uh, Indian tribal, and employer statement, okay? Might be the case that uh, you get to claim your kids on the health insurance. So that's where, you, you know, because again, if your employer's health insurance says one thing, your tax return says something different, which one's not correct, okay? All right, okay. And there's some examples there on the top of 520. Uh, should ask additional questions to meet your due diligence knowledgement. Okay. Um, like I said, I can't stress enough on these with the earned income credit and your due diligence on that. All right. Okay. And then they talk a little bit about that form on page 520, 521, uh, 8862. You know, if you have had one of these credits denied, you know, you have to now do, you know, how do you get it back, okay? And it isn't just simply a get out of jail free card, you're gonna have to really prove it. Okay, uh, a little exercise there about the income credit tables. Okay, all right, and Okay, trying to go through all this. You can tell that earned income credit's a hot topic, right? Okay, the additional child tax credit. Okay, this is also, so we're on page 531. All right, the additional child tax credit is a refundable credit. And again, same thing is on the table, kind of like the EIC. You know, if you have no tax bill for the child tax credit, that's a non-refundable. You could maybe get the additional child tax credit of $1,000. So again, low income family has no tax bill. So their child tax credit as a non-refundable is lost. So we get it as a refundable for a thousand dollars. Same thing, you have to do your due diligence. This is where, you know, like I said, uh, you know, if you think about a single mom, three kids making $15,000, okay? So, well, let's say, yeah, making $15,000. So right now, for head of household, her standard deduction is gonna wipe that out, okay? And if she has $15,000 of income, and she is uh, head of household with three kids, her earned income credit is $6,318. Plus, she has three kids as a refundable additional child tax credit, that's another 3,000. She's at $9,300. Each child be 1000 I thought you said it was $2,000. Uh, 2017 tax law, 1000 thousand. Yep, 2018, that refundable would be 1400 Yeah, so, um, so we're at almost $10,000 of refundable credits, and that is not credits, that is not her getting any money she had withheld from her paycheck. And she has to claim that on her following year's tax. And no. she gets the $10,000. So she'll just no. $10, no. Not on federal. Not on federal. Only if it was a state. And state, state she gets to take away those uh, refundable credits. With $10,000 in refundable credits, 
plus the taxes that she may have had withheld. So she she had another say she had another two thousand dollars in withholding. So her federal refund could be in excess of ten thousand dollars, of which only two thousand is her money that she paid in when she had withholding. Wow. Well, but she needs every penny of that if she has three children. Yes. Let's let's look at that. Yes. She's working for a living. She's trying. And she's yeah, trying to raise. Mm -hmm. I don't so, work and right. Yeah. And that's the thing. If you don't, if you don't work, you don't get any. Because mm -hmm. you have to have earned, earned income. income. Yes, right. I can't stress the words earned enough. Right. Yep. But then she'd be on all the federal assistance, and she'd pay forty thousand a year. What well, all the things that that would be you are still on federal assistance. Yeah, there's somewhere, and I'd have to look it up. There's something that there's an equation that. You know, if you have certain income, what it really is, the value of it because of things that you may be for. So, and again, some people, you know, and most people are very deserving of it, but there obviously is, and that's why the due diligence we have to do. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You know, so there's a lot of options for it. Yep. I would say individual basis. Yep. So. But like I said, so this in this uh, child tax credit again has to be a qualifying child, and that additional child tax credit is a refundable portion, the thousand dollars. It'll make more sense when we do the next chapter where we do non-refundable and we talk about the child tax credit and how it's calculated and what happens when it comes down. But just know that this is that. Okay. Uh, the other one, if you go to the very bottom of five thirty-three, we have the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Okay. This is the education or the college credit, it used to be called the HOPE credit, okay? This is one that up to 40% can be refundable. This is the one when I talk about college-age students filing for themselves as a non-dependent, this is usually the credit that makes or breaks the deal because the kids will think, oh, there's $2,500 out there. And they'll file, but they're only making $5,000. They don't get the credit, all right? Mom and dad, the two of them are making $90,000 together, they get the credit, both its non-refundable and refundable portion. But 40% of this is refundable, all right? So basically $1,000, all right? So back to our mom, single, had a household, okay? Three kids. Now she can add, you know, if one of the kids is in college, she can add another $1,000 to her refund. And again, this is a, you know, most of these refundable credits are found money. It's not money she paid in. Four years. And it's not consecutive. You have to be in there for four years. Yep. So some people can get this, you know, if they went two years and then came back for two years. But again, once we see the form in action, you know, you only get it for four. And that's why I say, remember when I showed you the diary thing on there? That, did I show you that, guys? The type in the diary, the F7, put on the diary? Okay, I'm going to show that tonight, Chris. I'll show it to you when we do the return here in a second. But this is one of the great ones. Earned income credit, great thing to put in the diary. Additional child tax credit and the American Opportunity. Refundable credit is a great place to put notes, and I'll show you that in a second. So if I took two years and went to one of my children, and they stopped college or they did, did their associates, but now they want to go for their bachelor's, and they live on their own now. They can only do two years on theirs, because I already took two years? Yes. You only get this for four years per, per a social security number. Yeah, it's tied to the, the child or the social. The, this is a credit that follows the child and where they're claimed. So if they're the case that, like you said, they're two years on your return and two on their own, that's their four years. Okay. All right. You can't, you can't spend eight years of college if they're receiving it. No. <laughs> no. Yep. And like I said, uh, you know, that American Opportunity Credit, it's, it's a big one. Because that's usually what swings the return of mom and dad's. Sometimes it's not as much the child credit or the exemption. It's that refundable, you know, we're talking $2,500. $1,500 is Pac-Man eating up your tax bill. And $1,000 of it is the Energizer Bunny that you're going to get no matter if you have a tax bill or not. That's $2,500 on the table. Plus, there's $400 credit on the state side. So we're almost at $3,000. And if they don't have it, that's $3,000 off mom's and dad's return that may only added. 200 to junior. And how do you think mom and dad are going to feel? 
Okay. That one we'll talk about. Uh, that is a non refundable. Lifetime learning doesn't have a refundable portion. Okay. So if you note, like I said at the bottom of 533, they kind of just gave us a quick little snippet of the American Opportunity Credit because most of what we're gonna talk about is gonna be when we do the refundable credits. Because if you notice on the syllabus, ref, uh, non-refundable credits, we spend two classes on. So these refundable ones are pretty limited, but we do them first because we stress, because the earned income credit and that additional child tax credit on most W-2 returns is in play if the income is lower. That's why we stress it, okay? All right. Uh, we talked about SS, excess Social Security and things withheld. We've already talked about that. Um, there's a little chart that's great right there in the middle that talks about that tax rate and the maximum. Just background. How did the railroad stuff get separate? Did that come first and then Social Security? Yeah. Oh, so that's... So they were before. Well, think about this country going back to a certain point. Who pretty much ran the company? What was it uh, J.P. Morgan? Wasn't he the railroad guy? Yeah. So that started first. And then oh, I'm sure he took care of his own. So, and yeah, you know, Social Security, uh, when we do retirement income, and I show you how the railroad one works different. Obviously, their rules have been in place for a long time. And, you know, I'm sure they set it up significantly on how they did it. So with, and they have their own retirement system. Uh, some government uh, positions, you don't get Social Security. So I don't think do elected officials, Congress, I don't think they have Social Security. Don't they have a different pension? I thought they so. changed. When I worked for the government, we didn't have Social Security. Mm -hmm. We were in our own retirement fund. Yep. But I thought that ended up changing after I left. Um, okay. All right. So we have that. And then the last little one is just for your knowledge, credit for tax on undistributed capital gains. Again, in nine years of doing tax returns, if I saw two of these, that was probably a lot, okay? You just don't see this one, all right? You might see it come over on a K-1 very rarely, you know, on the corporation, okay? Uh, page 537, health coverage tax credit, okay? Um, what this is, and when you read this one, you probably get a little confused. It has nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act, okay? I saw that this one a lot when I was up here in Lockport because of the way things worked with Delphi with the retirees, okay? Because they had to pay their own insurance, and because of the way that the whole bailout and all this happened, they were now eligible for this tax credit. <clears throat> so, like I said, it, it and and some of it has to do too uh, this this credit. Um, we would see a lot of them because if you could justify that your job had been shipped overseas and displaced, and you had to be retrained, you got this credit. So in the time that you were retraining, if you had to pay your own health insurance, you got the credit and basically got those premiums back as a refundable credit. Okay. So that's really where you see these most often. Um, it's, it has nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act, okay? So just make sure you understand that, all right? Uh, like I said, most of the time what you're gonna see with these, and you, and you see them very rarely, is somebody that either worked for Delphi up here or um, was displaced because their job was shipped overseas. Um, the unemployment office, when they're retraining them, will tell them about this credit, and trust me, they'll come in and ask for it. So, because the unemployment office tells them about it, okay? So, even if they paid their own insurance that weren't working because they were being retrained, mm -hmm. they would, this would get money back even if they had no earned. Yes, yep. So, like I said, it's basically reimbursing them for their uh, premiums while they're being retrained into a new job. So, okay, and, and like I said, Unemployment, uh, places that are retraining them, you know, they maybe were a welder at Delphi and their job ended up in China. And they qualify for this and they apply for it and things like that and they're still paying their health insurance for their family and whatever. 
then they can get this credit, to, you know, and it may not be their entire premiums, but it is a pretty good size credit to help them cover their healthcare cost. So, okay. So that is refundable credits. And the moral of the story is, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, okay? But like I said, the, you know, refundable credits, they're, 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 they're your due diligence. You have to make sure that you do that, so. All right, okay. Any questions on that? All right, we're gonna take a couple minutes. You can stretch your legs. Uh, what I would like you to do, um, let's see here. What I would like you to do is, uh, why don't we work on problem five two? Okay, so in your workbook, on um, page five ten, starts George and Jean Van Eaton Etten. I don't know how that's pronounced. Eaton Etten. George and Jean there. Okay, they have uh, a daughter, Amy. Uh, they got a couple W-2s there and a tuition statement. Okay, so if you want to start putting that in, and then uh, so go ahead and read their, their uh, interview notes, their little bullets there on page 510 and start putting 511 and then we'll go through this one, okay? All right. Okay. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to start going through some stuff here. Okay. Has everybody got the main info in? Okay. All right. So we're going to look at the bullet points here. All right. Uh, George and Jean filed a 1040 last year. They were able to itemize last year. They received $287 from the state refund. They would like to file a joint return, but would not, will not itemize this year. So, what about our state refund? Is it taxable? Yes. Okay. So we're going to go to 1040 page one. All right. And it says they did a 1040 and they did itemize. So we're going to hit yes. All right. And what's that make red? So 1040 page one, when I hit to the itemize last year, yes. And what's it asking for now? Where's that? Mm -hmm. It's asking for your taxable refunds, credits, or offsets mm -hmm. on line 10. Yep, so on line 10. So if you tab over twice. Yep, so answer yes there, because they did itemize. See that little box in the middle there, Jim? Oh, here. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. So that's where we put and the Tab over twice, and then put the 287 in. because it is taxable because we did itemize. We don't get to reduce it by anything. In this case, we'll talk about some more of those later. Perfect. Yep. So we got our 287 in there, okay? All right, next we had, um, next bullet point says that if George and Jean get a refund, they would like a deposit in their checking account. Uh, so we put that on the main info. Uh, we're gonna use the sheet on 511. Amy is in her third year full-time at Buff State. Amy has never been convicted of a felony for possession or distribution of a controlled substance. <laughs> Jim's going, that's kind of random, okay? But we'll come back to that, all right? Neither Jean nor, or George nor Jean were full-time students, and no EIC was disallowed, and they had health coverage the entire year, okay? So... We have, first thing is, we're gonna go over to page 512. We got a W-2 for George. He works for a sub-delivery company, okay? All right, so we're gonna get a W-2, and again, it's however you like to do it. Usually there's a W-2 on the tree on the left, or you can go to the 1040, or however you want to do, or add a form. Uh, in this case, George is the taxpayer. 
So we check that off. We confirm the address on there is correct. We put the employer number in there. Okay. And the employer's name is Sub Livery Company. Okay. Everybody got their W-2? No? Or did you get to it so that you can put it in? Yeah. Okay. And you got your W-2 up? Okay. All right. Okay. Now, we put in the uh, 30,000, five, oops, 545.33. And we have 1152 in withholding. Now, what's in box 12, though? $1,000. Or, I'm sorry, $2,000. Yep. So if you put that in as a D and put 2000 what did it do to your box 3 up top? Changed our Social Security rates. Yep. So it did everything for us, didn't it? And also to make sure that you, you check the retirement plan. All the retirement? Mm-hmm. All the 2,000. Yep. And you put in his code D, you'll notice that it automatically changes the numbers up top for you. Mm-hmm. They have, let's, let's put a year or anything? Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then don't forget to put your state withholding down at the bottom. Like I said, sometimes people with the state out of sight, out of mind, you know, they get a red number up in the box and they just assume that's because they live in New York, they're going to owe money one way or the other. My box in 14 is right. Is that worth the 2000 also? Nope. Uh, take that and there should be a 414 HSUB there. Yeah. Delete that and uncheck the 8880 box. Okay. All right. But you should make sure in 13, 12 and 13 you have the information about the retirement. The amount in 12 and then 13 you check the little box that says retirement plan. Okay. All right, and then like I said, what we can do, we have two ways um, on this one. Um, you can go back. If I'm on W-2s and I need another one, I usually just go to the white tab uh, right above the W-2 there, below the gray tiles, it says copy W-2. Yep, click on that, gets me a new one. And then, yep, so we can check spouse and then that becomes Gene, yep. Yep. Yeah, so everything's on there, and then you can just kind of go in to put hers in. She's working at steak on the grill. Wouldn't that sound good? Right now, yeah. <laughs> and she works at steak on the grill, and he works for sub delivery. Wow. She's a manager and a hostess. What would be your next question on these two? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Tips. Tips, exactly. <laughs> Silly Street. My daughter's up at Brockport and uh, her dorm did a field trip to the museum up there. They had the, she sent me a picture of her sitting on the steps of Sesame Street. So I guess the museum up there has a Sesame Street thing going on right now. So yeah, she was sitting on the steps, of, yeah, in college, but sitting on the steps of Sesame Street. So. Again, that's what I'm paying for. Same thing, yep. Lifetime of experience. That's right. All right. And she even had a picture taken with Big Bird. Okay. Oh, yeah. I would like to do that. Yeah. You're never too old. That's right. Okay. Same thing. We got a code D in box 12 with the retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And then make sure you put uh, your New York. And that withholding, don't put YS because it won't calculate. Okay. All right. So everybody got their two W-2s in yet? 
Okay. Let me know because we're going to move on to a couple things here. And like I said, the next thing is kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but not really. Okay. All right. Now, one thing I want you to do is I want you to take a look at your tree on the left. Okay. Uh, what's one thing that's red? Is it the ACA worksheet? Okay. Let's go to that one. And our bullet point said that they had health insurance the entire year. So those first two boxes are no and no, because we didn't have anything through the marketplace and we don't need to do any exemptions. And then check the box behind their name that they had all 12 months. Okay. Where was the, the ACA worksheet? Work yep, see it on your tree on the left? Yep. yep, there you go. First two boxes are no. And then uh, the first box behind each name to say they had it all 12 mm -hmm. months. Yep. Like I said, we're not gonna throw you that curveball yet. They will. They'll bring in uh, 1095 B's or C's, or they may have the DD code on their W-2. Yeah, if you see a DD code on their W-2 for health insurance and it says $18,000, that means they got pretty good coverage for the whole year. Okay. All right. So we have that. Uh, the other thing I want you to take a look at, does anybody have the 8880 with a red exclamation point? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's click on that. Mm -hmm. So let's click on that, okay? What this is, remember that little point, you guys have probably been reading it going, what difference does it make if G, George or Jean are full-time students, okay? This is a credit that the government says, thank you for saving for your retirement, okay? All right, so this is on that. So what's that question? Was a taxpayer a full-time student? No. Was a spouse? No. No. Uh, the 8880? Yeah. Oh, well, yep, see uh, where it says caution, and then in the last thing, there's some little boxes there. Okay. And if I scroll down on that, what's it say at the very bottom? At the bottom of that form, line 12. Mm -hmm. How much? Yeah. Zero. I have my two thousand, my one thousand. I now check something on the other side. Oh, yep. Yes, they know. Oh, okay. That's why that. That's where the question full-time student. Yep. But they make over that money. Oh, check. No, no. Yeah. Now let's go down. I've got right over. Yeah, there you go. Hey, go back up. What was that AGI number? Yeah, so you can see in the top of there that uh, Mary Ann point, pointed out that this credit, if you make 62000 or less married filing joint, then you would be eligible for this credit. So that's where on that W-2, making sure you get that D in there and check in that retirement plan box, okay? Mm -hmm. So, can you just do it yourself? then you would get a thing from the bank? You Yes, yep, if you made your IRA contributions. Yeah, when we do uh, adjustments to income, say that you didn't do it through your employer, but you come to me at tax time and I say, yo, $1,000. And you say, how do we get rid of that? I might say, well, we could put some money in a traditional IRA. So, yes, Jim. This was for last year too? For the savings that we're doing? The retirement, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, if, if you look at the top of the form, um, you cannot claim this credit if either of the following apply, okay? If your adjusted gross income is a single person, 31,000 or 62,000 joint, okay? Or if you were a full-time student. So in this case, neither one of those apply, so they're able to take this credit, okay? All right, okay, uh, so we clean that up. What's, every, what's everybody have in their blue box right now? Blue box? Yeah, their refund monitor up in the top left corner. Oh. Oh. Refund? Five ninety-five. Oh, I get the balance too. How much? Fourteen fifty-six. I have two seventy-one. I have two seventy-one. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're gonna like me better. I have. I don't even have a refund. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. All right. So, well, we're going to kind of, it should be balance due 271, a red number, and the state should be a refund of 1941 because I just want to kind of. I had the state refund in 1941. Okay. But the state balance due? I have, the, I have federal as I may Okay, so let's take a look. Let's go to page 1040, page one. Okay, what does everybody have on line seven? Okay, okay. Uh, line 10. Okay, yep, so adjusted gross income is way at the bottom. Okay, so let's go to the top of page two. So 1040, page two. Uh, standard deduction. Mm -hmm. Exemptions. Yep, line 42, 12,150. Okay. Uh, tax, 2244. Okay. Oh, that's the taxable income. What's the tax amount? 22, okay. Uh, line 51, the retirement. Okay. So that should have their tax bill down to what? Okay. Federal tax withheld. Line 64. Mm -hmm. 1,673. Line 64. No, I have two, five, Okay, so go back to your W-2s and check your federal withholding. What's that? It's not right on there. Okay, so put in the correct amount on the federal withholding there. But, but when I go on it, it's 2018. And then when I... But box two, what's your box two read? Now it changed it. I didn't put it in though. I just tabbed it and I changed it to the 2018. But what's your box two say on your W-2? Oh, one minute. Okay, yep. Got it, Jim? Uh, Did you check your... Okay. Now I'm going to check the other one. I got it. Balance due at 271. There you go. The state is, there's nothing there for the state. Uh, on the main info, did you remember to put New York in there? So what's the balance again? It's due 271 with that? Yes. Okay, there you go. So yeah. make sure you put New York in there. I looked down at the wrong one. There you go. 1941. Okay, so we're all on the same page. All right? Now, we're going to do that next slip. So I want you to kind of remember those numbers. So we had a number where we uh, owed 271 and state was 1941 refund, okay? So we're gonna do this education credit. I want you to go to 1040 page two, okay? And I want you to go down to line 50, okay? Actually, let's do it this way. Let's go down to line 68, okay? Uh, remember we said one of these refundable credits is what? The American Opportunity Credit, correct? Okay, and we have a form there that we talked about, the 8863. So I want you to go over there, light up the box and hit F9. So your number box at the right, light it up. And see how we say new 8863 education credit? Click on that and hit OK. And it should take you to the form like you see up on the wall there. All right. So, what's the first thing it's asking for? Student's, Student's name. So, this is for Amy, right? Mm -hmm. Amy and. All right. We got to put her social on there. All right, and then it's asking, she went to uh, school, so Buffalo State College. And you gotta put the address on there, 1300 Elmwood Avenue, that's actually right, isn't it? Yep. 
okay? And then it says in question two, it talks about did the student re receive a form 1098T? We're gonna say yes, okay? And the next one says, did the student receive a 1098T from 2016? We're gonna say no on that, okay? All right, and then box four, you put in the EIN number, which is uh, for Buff State, that's 16125-1412, okay? All right, everybody got that so far? Okay. All right, let's see where you're at, Jim. I just did too fast. That's all right, that's all right. You're good there, okay. 1098T, yep, so that's the form they got, so you're gonna check that one, yes. Okay, and then we're gonna put no for that one. And then the EIN number, that's this number right here. It's kind of like uh, your W-2, it's an EIN number. Okay, and then when you get to that point, I want you to scroll down and get ready on line 23, okay? All right, so what's 23 say? This is where uh, Mary Ann was asking about the years. So on line 23, we have, has the HOPE Scholarship, that's what it used to be called, or the American Opportunity Credit been claimed for the student for any four tax years? Doesn't say in order, okay? But what did it say on the bullet? Okay, so. You would assume. We're gonna say, okay, that's great. So that she's claimed it for three, She's in her third year full time, okay? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is make note of that, all right? I want everybody to hit F7. But do we hit yes first on that? Nope, don't hit and answer anything, hit F7 first. Yep, big gray box like that showed up in the middle. In the middle section, there's little gray tabs, starts with the word general. Go over to diary, okay? And I'm gonna click on add a note. And it gives me a little date and time stamp, doesn't it? Okay, I'm gonna type in there, Amy is in her third full year of college. Okay, why would that maybe help me? Because what is gonna happen next year? It'll be her last year to claim it, okay? Once I've typed that in, I have to go down the right and hit save note. Okay, and then that's safe. So that always travels with this social security number. So the, the, the taxpayer's social security number, this note will travel with that. So next year when we bring up a return or carry it forward or whatever, that note will be in there. So when you're doing this return, you might look in there and say, oh, I guess this is Amy's fourth year. This is, and you can tell the client, this is the last year she gets the American Opportunity Credit. Okay. All right, so I'll close that out, hit the little X. And we're gonna go back to our questions on the Form 8863. First one is, yep, we knew that she has not collected for four years, so we answer no, okay. Next question is what? Was the student enrolled at least half time or at least one academic period? If I look at, on page 513, my uh, 1098T, box eight, what does it say? So look in your workbook on the, the problem there. Yeah. Yep, so box eight. So we hit yes on that one. Okay. Did the student complete the first four years of post-secondary education before 2017? No, she's in her third year. Okay. And the last one is, there's, there's Jim's questions. He thought that was kind of random. Uh, was the student convicted before the end of 2017 of a felony for possession or distribution of a controlled substance? Okay, so if they're doing extracurricular activities in their chemistry class and they've been convicted, they're not gonna get this. I will tell you a quick story about this and it was actually, I was helping somebody, I was actually doing two returns at the same time, but I was in that cubicle right there. And I had a young lady sitting there and her friend came along with her and she was filing the return and uh, her friend was just sitting there, didn't say a word, just sitting on there on her phone, never said a word, never said a word. And I get to this portion of the return and I'm going through the due diligence with her. And I said, have you ever been convicted for a felony for possession or distribution of a controlled substance? She goes, no. Her friend, again, has never said a word, hasn't even acknowledged that I exist across the desk, looks at her friend and goes, 
well, what about last year when you got pulled over and when you were in the car with those guys? Isn't that, you know, basically she threw her friend under the bus. Because the girl had answered no, knowing that she needed to answer no to get the American Opportunity Credit. Her friend goes, didn't you get arrested for the possession last year when you were in that car with those guys? So then all of a sudden, off the table, and she took everything off the table, slid it in her little bag, and they got up and left. I hope they're still friends, but, uh, you know. But like I said, it was just so funny because that girl never said a word the whole time. So obviously she was listening, but never acknowledged anything. So. Why did we answer no on 23? 23? Because if they've already taken it for four years, like we just made they notes in the diary. For any four tax years. Yes. They took. They did take it for two of the four. Yeah. So if the answer yes, because they did take it for two of the four. It says has been claimed for the student for any four years. Have you already claimed four years? Totally. Exactly. Yeah. Well, gyros. Okay. So once we answer those questions that way, and we look down at the bottom, and here's Ann, where your question comes up. Lifetime learning is kind of off the table because we want to take the better of the two, the American opportunity. So line 27, the box is red, correct? Yes. Okay, now, back to the 1098T in your workbook. We received, okay, so make sure you go to your workbook. They received, uh, or they paid $8,214. That's the qualified tuition and related expenses, okay? Of that, $6,000 was scholarships, okay? So you can only claim the money that you paid. Are scholarships money that you paid? Nope. No. So we subtract the 6,000 from the 8214, what do we get? 2214, so that's what we put in there. So it's always the case that when you put these in there, okay, all right, okay, always make sure that those go in there, all right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now, New York State considerations. Once you look on your tree on the left, <clears throat> um, and if you go down the bottom of the tree, there's a little form called NY272. Mm -hmm. Okay. Click on that. This is the college credit on the state side. NY NY272, so all the way at the bottom of the tree, okay? Uh, first question is, did you file an 8863? Yes, we did, we just completed that. And then we go down there and uh, part one, question C says, is the student dependent? Yes, they are. And was this for undergraduate? Yes, it was. And how much are the qualified tuition expenses? What was that number? 2000? Yep, 2214. Yep. So we put that in there. Okay. All right. Now, one thing I want you to do is I want you to go to, on the left, you see NY272, page two. Okay. All right. Uh, see question eight? All right. We have two options. I want you to check the first box where it's claimed as an itemized deduction and then hit enter. Okay? Wait, number eight. Number eight, hit the first box. It says itemize. The refund, if this is uh, for that, is how much? 1941. Okay, so your two numbers. Oh, if you are you talking here? Yep, yep, exactly. Oh, I'm looking at that. Yep. One. Okay. okay. So, yeah, yeah, right yep. So, <laughs> um, so that number that's less than what we want, isn't it? Okay. Now let's check the box below that that says it use it as a tuition credit. So instead of itemizing it, which we can do on the state, uh, it's better. So that's one of those things. If you have somebody that has higher income and itemizes you may want to check that other box because it may be more beneficial to them to use it on their itemized as opposed as the $400 credit, okay? All right, okay. 
Now let's clean up just a few other things on the left. Um, so let's go back up, see where it says schedule EIC? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to that. All right, okay. Do we have anything in red on there? Yeah. Okay, Amy was, let's add, is it that question 4A? Yeah, it's the oh yeah, up at the top, yep. Um, so we're not gonna worry about that one. Okay, so I want you to go down. All right, uh, was a child under age 24 at the end of 2017 and a student? Yep, okay. Uh, were they totally and permanently disabled? Nope, okay. At $46,047, do they qualify for the earned income credit with one child? No. Nope, okay. So once we did our due diligence there, that's where it's no. Okay. Does it say no on it? No yeah, but it doesn't because if I have 46047, um, it's zero. That? Okay, what's that? Did you put that figure on the form there? No. Oh. It's just once you answer those questions, okay? okay. All right. Okay, so we have that. All right. On the 8863, okay, you got a red exclamation point? Yeah. Same thing like Jim said on the other one right at the top. It's asking us, did they disallow? That's a no. Okay. All right. Uh, if we go to do, 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 our 8867, our due diligence. All right. Chances are right there, part one, due diligence requirements. This is all going to be for the earned income credit, or excuse me, the uh, American Opportunity Credit. If we had the earned income or additional child, they'd all be checked. Okay. So you'll just go through and answer those like you would have before, okay? So what's everybody got for their federal refund? Okay, state refund? 2141. Yep, go back to your uh, New York page two. Uh, or excuse me, uh, your New York 272 page two, that little, remember that education form that we did? Yep, and make sure you check it as a credit, not as itemized. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we're fiddling with that. And then once you hit enter, yep. Yep, did you click it and hit enter? Okay, what'd your state refund? Oh, there we go. I think it's a check mark. Okay, now we're at 2141. 2141, good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, if you remember, before we did this education credit, the Van Eaton's owed $271 on the federal. And the state, they had a refund of 1941. State wasn't much different, but I just had a give or take. Yeah, about a $2,000 swing, didn't I? See where I talk about the dependents and not having them on the return? thousand dollars for that year for college and you get another extra twelve hundred back. <laughs> Every little bit helps. Yeah. Any more of the credits about equal to what they pay for books. So all right. That's a whole all right. So that's what we have, okay? All right. And that's it for today.